All right, now we're to our last session of the morning. And we're going to welcome a couple of speakers on climate change. Um, first, we'll hear from John and Susan Derevic, who will talk about Citizens Climate Lobby. John, a retired marine biologist, conducted research in fish ecology and evolution for the Marine Research Institute of the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Also retired, Susan taught at public schools for 37 years. John and Susan now lead the Bradenton chapter of the Citizens Climate Lobby and are active in several climate change and justice groups. Next, we'll hear from Karen Willey, who will talk about climate change education and communication. After recently selling her business around the Bend Nature Tours, her mission continues with helping our local community learn more about Florida native plants and ecosystems. Just this week, Karen was appointed the climate change point person for Sarasota Audubon. She will be hosting a series of watershed climate walks starting in January to help us learn how to participate in local solutions. Please welcome John and Susan Derivan. Uh, thanks, Arlene. I'm John. This is Susan. Yeah, that's pretty easy to figure out anyway. Let's, let, we're almost to lunch, folks. We're almost to lunch. Uh, I do owe you an apology, I guess. I should have put a slide up here that said Citizens Climate Lobby and Political Will for a Livable World. That's our, that's our motto, and uh, we operate at the uh, level of the federal government on policy, not necessarily any particular techniques. So and this is uh, from the Yale Climate Communications uh, Program. This is, this is their big five here. Scientists agree, it's real, it's us, it's bad, but there's hope. I think that everybody knows that's what's happening. Okay, yeah, uh, we need to remember that we all benefited from fossil fuels. Uh, but, of course, we can't continue that uh, because we're cooking life off the planet here at a pretty good clip. So we need to transition from fossil fuel-based economy um, that emits greenhouse gases or heat-trapping gases uh, and get to one based on clean energy. What can our government do in order to incentivize that kind of a transition? Well, it turns out there's probably only about four things. Uh, they can subsidize the new, the clean energy. Uh, the problem with that is they'd be picking winners, and they kind of don't like to do that, and we probably shouldn't want them to do that. Uh, they can regulate the uh, old uh, inefficient energy and uh, the fossil fuels, uh, but that's not very popular and gets hung up in courts, and all, there's all sorts of problems with that. N numbers three and four here are both um, a means to put a price on carbon that will reflect the damage that it's doing in our atmosphere. Um, of the two, cap and trade's a little tough to explain. Uh, we were started out doing that a number of years ago, apparently. Uh, we weren't members then, but uh, it's, it's tough. It's kind of tough to explain. Uh, when your congressman says he prefers that, ask him to explain it and see what happens. Um, so we're left, left with a tax, and uh, we have a particular kind of tax. Um, sin taxes, of course, are, are designed to uh, discourage negative b behaviors, and ours is, is combined with kind of a stimulus, and how does that look? So this is our proposal. First, we place a fee on carbon-based fuels at their source, the mine, or the well. Um, we start that fee low, and of course, it's based on the number of car the amount of carbon dioxide emitted, not the amount of coal, oil, or gas extracted. And we increase that fee gradually so that everybody can ad adjust, both consumers and producers, because the producers are going to pass this extra cost on to the consumers. Of course. The money collected will all be returned to American households on an equal basis. You and Bill Gates will get the same amount. 
And there's a, uh, um, a border adjustment, we call it, basically a, a, a tariff kind of system that's, that's been vetted through all the appropriate channels. And uh, what it's done is to keep the, it's designed to keep the playing field level as far as from one country to the other goes. So if a, if a country, for example, does not uh, put a tax on their fossil fuels, they can import to us, theoretically, and um, get a better price, have a lower price. So what we do is we tax them at, uh, we put a tariff on it at the border to level that out. Uh, that also incentivizes them to put a tax on uh, on the on the fossil fuels themselves, because if they do that, then we don't tax them, because it's already a level playing field. <clears throat> this policy is already in the uh, House of Representatives, Federal House of Representatives, as uh, Bill Number 763. Um, it's simple, fair, market-friendly. Um, and the main thing about it is that it's effective it's good for people in a couple of ways, um, by reducing pollutants that go along with the mining and the um, uh, so forth of fossil fuels, and you know the particulates in the air from burning them. Um, it'll be good for the economy, um, creating jobs, 2.1 million over the first 10 years. Uh, be, it's bipartisan, that's kind of important these days, or it won't possibly last for very long, and it's revenue neutral, um, won't grow the government. Um, how do we know that? Well, we know that because it's been studied um, by people who do that kind of tax analysis. And um, Regional Economic Models has done it, and now just recently Columbia University is, is doing it again. And, uh, I guess the point here is, is that there's a lot more studies going into this proposal and, and the tax than you find in most bills that are promoted in the Congress. So here's the kind of things that were in the study. Here's the increase in the total employment. Here's the increase in, in GDP. Oh, this is, I don't know if you can see that, but it's going over like 20 years. And uh, the study also um, was able to assess which kinds of uh, industries are going to benefit the most. And um, healthcare industry will benefit, that's the top line there, positive is to the right. Um, and then comes retail trade, and then comes the service industry, and then the hospitality industry, stuff that we do a lot here in Florida already. So Florida tends, tends to benefit from this quite a bit. Okay, we're very transparent here, so this is where we change speakers. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> well, that was the wrong button. Uh, John? <laughs> John? That was the wrong button. Someone should have clued me in. I'll say this. Um, this bill is very interesting, and Citizens Climate Lobby sends people to Washington to lobby, and um, Erica, who's sitting back there, and I just got back last night from Washington. 800 of us were there um, for the November conference and lobbying. We were in over 400 of the, of the offices. We meet with Republicans, we meet with Democrats, we meet with independents. Which button do I use? Left and right, thank you. Uh, to where? Okay. And one of the things that we brought to Mr. Buchanan's um, energy and environment aid, a young man that we met with in, in last June, and we met with him again, was information about how this will help us in this district. Uh, the question is, if you put a fee, if you charge the, um, the fossil fuel companies more to extract the material and they pass the fee along, is that going to hurt those among us who can't afford any increase in our cost of living? And we did not want to do that, so we, we had the study because we returned the money to the people equally, 
We had a study done to determine how that will help the people of low income and moderate income. So this is our district, and it's divided by quintiles of income. And quintile one means the 20% of us in Mr. Buchanan's district who make the least amount of money. And it in in indicates that um, about 80 88% of them will actually benefit from a dividend paid to them from this policy in, in spite of the increase in their cost of living. Now remember we said there's hope. The approximate number of adults or percent of adults who think that global warming is happening in the Yale study from 2016 was about 70%. Mr. Buchanan did an Insta poll a, a good year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, and he came up with about 68% in this district of his respondents who said they felt this was serious. So there's more information on the website that indicates the same kind of thing. People are worried about global warming, but what's, pro what's a problem here is that people don't talk about global warming. They don't tend to talk to each other about it. So what should we do? What should you and I do? If you were to join Citizens Climate Lobby, and it's citizensclimatelobby.org, and there's no fee to join this, and you look on their website, which is a huge website, you can learn about the bill that's in Congress right now, and you can join us in our lobbying efforts. When we were there on Tuesday, I have to say this, the group that was in Senator Rubio's office convinced him to join the brand new Senate Climate Solutions Caucus. Senator Rubio, yes. There's an excellent first step for him. Actually, it's not the first step, but that's a big step for him. And we have some sheets back in the other room there where you can add your name and say thank you because we want to know that he has the support of us for this. You can learn about climate change science, about the carbon fee and dividend proposal, how to talk with legislators. We're well trained on that. And how to write effective letters. You may see letters to the editor from us. And there's the slide John was looking for about CCL. It's a wonderful group to join. And as I said, there's absolutely no charge in joining it. We have a number of the members in this room right here. There is a, a group for Citizens Climate Lobby in every congressional district in the US. So if you're visiting here right now, or if you tend to live in two parts of the country, you will find a group in your other home also. We're also across the, United uh, across the world in many other countries, because we need every country to put a price on carbon. That's our, that's our goal. Well, hello. All right. So I'm going to talk about kids and climate change. So they're switching. There we go. So I just sold Around the Bend Nature Tours in July. And before I envisioned Around the Bend Nature Tours, I had two young daughters, and I taught preschool. After seven years, I was developing age-appropriate science programs for the entire school. And when I was asked by the organizers today to talk about how climate change is affecting children today, I went back to the basics. So as, as uh, Susan said, 70% of Americans are sure that climate change is happening. Yet most of them aren't talking about it. The more it becomes mainstream, the more we will be able to focus on solutions. So I want to reinforce to you that concern for our climate is normal. A vast majority agree we should be teaching climate change, yet few teachers are actually teaching it. So why is this? So the Yale um, climate change uh, group studied this, and they found out that 65% of teachers believe, um, say that it's outside their subject area, which is debatable. But 20% say that students are too young. And these, these teachers are correct. So we need to talk about it. Talking about climate change with other adults and including our feelings about it. It's a necessary first step towards helping our kids cope. Focus on feelings not only for kids, but for ourselves, because kids will pick up on your stress. And a stressed adult will create a stressed kid, even though they weren't stressed before. 
So we need to make responsible decisions to teach climate change at appropriate age levels. How to talk about it? The answer is to stop the crisis mode. Children, okay, I went ahead. Crisis not only scares kids, it's turning adults away. We don't want to hear it, so we stick our heads in the sand. Let's talk about the positives and what's happening right now. Use a reasonable tone, not a panic tone. Focus on values. The value of protection is proven to work. And focus on local solutions that create hope. Consider this. In just one semester in the fall of 2017, 9 million US students missed school due to um, natural disasters, which scientists say are becoming more frequent and severe because of climate change. That is a fact, but a scary one, not one we need to discuss with children. So how do we talk to them? Developmental stages need to be considered. Children are not miniature adults. They think and process information differently than we do. But they are paying attention, so we need to be careful what we say around our own kids. So what do we talk to them about? How do we teach them about climate change? First of all, we don't, not with young children anyway. Under eight years old, kids are ready to learn about the wonders of nature. Teach them about birds and bugs and wildflowers and crabs. By upper elementary, fourth and fifth graders are ready for basic science, weather, climate, heat expansion, and use metaphors like the heat trapping blanket. That one goes, when we burn fossil fuels like coal, oil, and natural gas, we add increased carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which creates a heat trapping blanket around the earth. And that blanket and added carbon dioxide heats the air as well as the world's oceans. But there are a lot of smart people working hard on it, and there are lots of things we can do. By middle school, the words climate change enter the Florida State standards. Students are ready to learn about Earth systems, the geosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, the carbon cycle, ocean acidification, and sea level rise. And we have this awesome local resource available from the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program. The Climate Change Tech Kit is available on loan to your school with all the materials you need to provide science labs in your classroom. And to help teachers learn how to frame the message so it isn't big and scary and impossible, I present to you the beginning workshop from NOKI. NOKI is the National Network of Ocean and Climate Change Interpretation. And it's a group that aims to change the national conversation around climate change to be positive, civic-minded, and solutions-focused. I can teach your team how to use these methods. Here are some great websites for students. And there's a local key group called Sarasota Students for Climate that you can find on social media. But the main thing about, for kids is to get them outdoors. You don't have to look far to expose your kids to nature. Give them time to explore and process and play. You can start with ants on the sidewalk or crabs in the mangroves. Encourage your kids to look at the bugs. Talk about what the bugs are doing, because everything has a role to play here. Here, we're not just pulling air potato. We're pulling air potato with kids. Teach them to understand the web of relationships in nature rather than dwelling on the damage, because it's very hard to defend what you don't love. Let them get their hands in the earth. This is soil, not dirt. Give them a basic lashing lesson and let them try it for themselves. Teach them to respect and protect. When they are older, these basic truths will inform their logical learning. It's important that they're feeling carefree and joyful and finding things that are wonderful about the world 
even though they're also addressing big life challenges. If necessary, remind them to get outside, take breaks, and enjoy just being a kid. Local solutions are evidence-based policy programs and initiatives that address the problem on a community-wide scale. They create an informed and engaged citizenry. Of course, our instinct is to protect our kids from the harshness of the world or from ever feeling bad. But once they are old enough in, to be in school, they it may not, and understand a bit of the news, this may be difficult. So it's our job instead to be open to hearing how children might be feeling and thinking about climate change and to help them manage those feelings. And in order to do that, remember to take care of yourself. Take breaks, reach out for support, create a local chat group with like-minded friends, look to others to help when you are tired. We are in this together. Hope is not a landing place or a single destination. It's all of us working together on community level solutions. Thank you. All right, so we have a few minutes for questions. If you'd like to enter any questions you have at menti.com, we've got some up here on the board already. So it looks like John and Susan, how are jobs created through this proposal that CCL is recommending? Hello, hello. Okay. Jobs, okay, well, uh, like I say, the, the, all this has been modeled, right? That it hasn't, hasn't happened yet, so it's all done by modeling, just the, the, the same as your weather report is done by modeling. Um, you know, we usually, we usually think that if, if we're going to make this transition, then you're, then you're going to make jobs in the, in the solar industry, solar installation of solar panels and all the engineering that goes along with that too. But um, the plan we have is, is market-based and all this money coming back is going to uh, be used for whatever you want to use it for, okay? You're going to get a, you're going to get a dividend. So if you want to pay that, and apparently uh, the modeling showed that a lot of people would want to do more about their health. So you'd spend more money on your, your health and jobs would be created to accommodate the additional need for uh, health care. Is, is that the kind of so yeah I think that talk about the thinking behind uh, your proposal in terms of so the other question says why not use that tax to fund renewable energy projects rather than offering a dividend so what well, is the thinking uh, behind your strategy there well we would rather have the people uh, decide where the money goes than have you know somebody allocate it some politician allocate it to his brother-in-law, perhaps, for, for But do whatever. you think that proposal alone will be enough to re reduce consumption and really address the, the issue that we have? Or do we need to pair that with other policy changes? This proposal what? is uh, projected to reduce carbon uh, by 40% in 12 years, and by the end of it in about 20 years to have reduced it to nearly zero. So it's one, it's one big piece of the climate change problem. Okay, Karen, one for you. Can you share stories about hopeful conversations with local youth on climate? Do you have any ongoing projects there? So, local stories. I have in the past worked with um, the youth a lot. Right now I'm not doing anything currently, but when, um, when I first was trained to communicate, I brought it back and trained um, my guides at Around the Bend Nature Tours. And we um, introduced, uh, when we had time, because we're, we're running on a bus schedule, um, we introduced climate change to the students at the beginning of a field trip and would tell, you know, ask what they knew about climate change and what they understood about it. And, um, it was a mixed bag, but the ones that had teachers that were already discussing the causes of climate change, they got it. They got it and they are, um, they actually 
understood and they came up with solutions like the simple ones like burning not burning fossil fuels and and carpooling and taking the bus and um, you know they get it and the, the I went out to one of the climate um, Friday afternoon climate walks recently and the kids that are organizing that they get it too that's that gives me hope these kids are growing up with it as Sarah said earlier when she was talking about sustainable farming these kids have grown up with this and they understand that they have to do something about it and they are hopeful about it they're gonna fix it we had a number of children come to Washington with us. I was in a meeting in one of the offices with an 11-year-old girl and her mother, and she spoke up about the health care issue. She said very clearly to the um, energy aid there that when people have extra money in their pocket, the first thing they'll spend it on is the health care for their family. We bring in college kids, high school kids come, and lots of people's children and grandchildren come with us. Karen, do you want to share any more about the program that we're going to kick off in January? With sure. Um, last year I started this, the Coastal Climate Walks, and we're moving inland, so we're calling them the Watershed and Coastal Climate Walks. And they're going to be uh, available to anyone who wants to join. Sarasota Audubon is sponsoring them this year. Um, so a different park every week. Um, and it, from 9.30 to about 11.30 or 12, we'll walk through a local resource like Ken Thompson Park, we'll be talking about sea level rise. At Robinson Preserve, we'll be talking about mangrove migration. At the celery fields, we'll walk about, talk about how um, stormwater protection and wetlands are important in, to the whole picture. So we'll be looking at local impacts and talking about s local solutions. So it's a real positive thing because really the only way to fix this is to talk about it, make it mainstream, and make it happen. So join us on a Friday. So following up, do you feel it is more important to teach the younger generation to be fearless rather than hopeful? Will that have a greater impact to propel students into action? Kind of a philosophical. Teach them to be fearless. fearless. I think power, knowledge is power. I think someone said that earlier. And so if you, and that's what I'm always telling the kids when I'm out there with them, if they have a question, once you know the answer, you don't have to be afraid. So I'm afraid to go into the water because I'm a fifth grader and I think there's a shark out there in the grass flats and it's going to eat me. And Sean, my marine biologist, says, there's never a shark on Tuesday. But, <laughs> but we get those kids out there and they realize how cool it is. And once they understand there's nothing to be afraid of, then they can move forward. So we don't have, just teaching them to, to be is teaching them to be fearless. And teaching them to be is teaching them hope. I'm not telling them to be hopeful. I'm giving them the power to be hopeful and fearless. And just to close, John and Susan, can you tell folks how they can get involved with CCL? I know you have monthly meetings. Maybe you can share some information about that. Just go to the website, citizensclimatelobby.org, click join. Uh, John and I will get a message if you're in Mr. Buchanan's district, and uh, we'll respond to that. We'll let you know we meet once a month, and uh, you can get as involved as you would like. All right, please join me in thanking all of our speakers this morning with a big round of applause. And we meet in Newtown at the Betty Johnson Library. <laughs> The Sustainable Communities Workshop organizers are pleased to integrate environmental stewardship considerations in planning this workshop. I'm going to let them sneak behind me. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And then I'm going to share some of those with you. The event is being held in this beautiful resource conserving building that is USGBC LEED certified. The preserved wetland on this property serves as a living lab for the scout troops. Food served includes locally sourced items. Vegetarian options are available. Coffee is fair trade organic, and the food is supplied by a local Sarasota County Green business partner. The tableware is biodegradable or reusable. All food waste is being composted today thanks to Randall Penn, the waste reduction agent at UF IFAS Extension, Sarasota County. The registration was online with a limited number of agendas printed this year, and speakers' presentations will be available through the conference website, saving paper and emissions. While we did our best to reduce the impact of the event itself, 
We also secured a donation of carbon credits for five metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent to ensure the full event is carbon neutral. Thank you to Schneider Electric for that donation. Now I'd like to take a minute to thank our 2019 Sustainable Communities Workshop organizing partners. Representatives from these organizations met monthly throughout the entire year to ensure a great event for you today. Their time and commitment is critical to the success of this event. So thanks go out to Sarasota County, the UF IFAS Extension, Manatee County, the City of Sarasota, the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, the Florida Department of Health in Sarasota County, Ringling College of Art and Design, and Transition Sarasota. We want to thank our sponsors again for their generous support of today's workshop, especially our platinum level sponsors, Manatee County Government, and the Gulf Coast Community Foundation, and our gold level sponsor, Transition Sarasota. Please don't forget to post on social media about what you've learned and will learn this afternoon and what actions you plan to take. The hashtag to use on Twitter and Facebook is hashtag SCW19. At this point, we're gonna take our break for lunch. Lunch is being served by Zildjian Catering over here to my left. Please enjoy the food and take some time to visit our sponsors, exhibitors, and electric vehicle ride and drive display outside during your lunch break. And don't forget to go upstairs to visit our youth displays. So thank you, and we'll begin our afternoon session at 12.55.